Thank you very much for that welcome and apologies. Uh, I am going to speak to you in English. Uh, the most important Swedish word that I've learnt so far is frika. Um, <laughs> And I'm not sure that I can talk about that for half an hour. So um, please, if you wave at me, um, I'll know that you want me to slow down. I'm hoping my accent won't be too difficult. Um, and I hope that you'll have lots of questions for me at the end of uh, the presentation. Um, I really want to thank Yvonne and the, the region for inviting me to come. Uh, the south of Australia is a very long way from the north of Sweden, uh, but I think when we want to talk about tobacco control, uh, we know that the industry is very international. They know everything that happens in every corner of the world. And as people who are trying to get rid of tobacco, we also need to share information about what happens in each corner of the world, because many of the lessons are exactly the same. So what I want to talk about is what we did in Australia, just as a case study. Um, I'm not coming to Sweden to say that uh, the Swedish politicians should do exactly what we did, uh, although that wouldn't be a bad idea. I know you have a new government. Uh, perhaps there's a chance for that. Uh, more to say, here is an example of what's happening around the world. Uh, Sweden and Australia actually have very similar communities. Uh, we have very strong social security, we have very um, good health outcomes, and sometimes that makes us a bit complacent. We don't need to do too much because our smoking rate is low. I, I don't believe that. Um, I think that the numbers of people dying still in Australia and in Sweden from tobacco-related diseases are very high, and there are very good reasons to act. So let me take you through this. I wanted to show you something else first. This is a picture of me as a 10-year-old uh, with my father, my first visit to Sweden. Uh, we thought it was a very beautiful country. Um, usually you like photos of you more when you're younger. I prefer myself now than with the pigtails. Um, the reason I put this photo up here is uh, half to say I've had some connection with Sweden for a long time. More to tell you, this photo was taken only a couple of months before my father died. Uh, he was a smoker. Uh, he died of cancer of the esophagus, so down from the throat. And whilst I didn't know at the time that I would have the opportunity to help other people not have that experience, uh, I do think it's very motivating. And almost everybody in Australia, in Sweden, around the world knows somebody who has died from cancer and been affected in some way by tobacco and the bad... Uh, of course, harms that it can cause to you. So I thought I should show you that. But in Australia, why did we act? Not because my father died when I was 10, there was a bit of extra motivation, but actually because we have, uh, although we have very low smoking rates and they are declining, we still have 15,000 Australians that die every year from tobacco-related disease. Uh, that's a lot of pain and suffering leading up to those deaths. It's a very big cost to our health system as well. We want to get that smoking rate uh, down to 10% by 2018. So we said, what else do we need to do? I want to quickly uh, refresh for you that in Australia, we already, many years ago, have banned advertising. We have no advertising in television and magazines. We have no sponsorship of sporting teams. Uh, unlike in Sweden, you cannot see a packet of tobacco in a shop. It's behind closed doors. You must ask for the, the cigarettes. Then uh, the shop assistant gets it out of a pack. Uh, something I was surprised to see you don't have here in Sweden. So we said, what's the next thing we should do? How do we keep the pressure on for smoking rates to go down? Um, how do we do something that's comprehensive? How do we protect children so they don't start smoking in the first place? So the most important motivation for me as the health minister, although I wanted to convince people to stop smoking, my main focus was how do I stop people starting to smoke? And that's why we looked at the pack. So, in Australia, we call the reforms that we've introduced plain packaging. Um, this doesn't mean that they are in a white packet. I'm going to show you a picture. What it means is there is no branding, no colourful logos, no Marlboro Man, no bright red and pink packs. 
Every packet of cigarettes is the same size, the same colour, very large health warnings, not just written warnings, but pictorial warnings, and they are designed to be as ugly and as boring as possible. So this shows you what our plain packs look like. Um, this is a real person. This is a Canadian man. Uh, his family were devastated by his death and offered us the photos to use as part of our warnings. Um, you can imagine that these are not popular and that's obviously the purpose uh, of the packs. I think it's important to show you these because quite a lot of... Uh, international people have explained to me that uh, they don't think these packs are plain and that we should call it something else, standard packs, graphic warnings. Uh, and of course, we, we can do that. Um, I do also want to say to you, we had a lot of research done on which colour is the least attractive, which colour makes you look at the picture most. Um, you know, there are people who make a living out of this sort of research, uh, and it's actually very technical and something that I think it's worth thinking about. The reason we were so focused on our PACs is in Australia, with advertising bans, with point-of-sale restrictions, the packet of cigarette was the last bit of advertising that the industry was using to promote their products to the community. All of you have seen a smoker. Every single 20, 30 times a day, they take the packet of cigarettes out of their pocket, out of their purse, put it on the table, show their friends that they're talking to. So we wanted that last bit of advertising to actually stop being available to the industry. And part of the reason was we looked also around the world at how packs were being used. Uh, as I explained, that person-to-person -person advertising um, and a very clear focus on young people. In our country, and I've seen elsewhere around the world, the tobacco industry says that they do not target children. They are not campaigning towards children. But I want to show you a few examples which I think make clear that that is absolutely not true. These are some packs from Canada that have same laws as us, all of the same laws as us except for plain packs. What uh, this packet shows is the graphic health warning is simply put on an outside pocket which you can then take off and throw away and then you can have your nice pretty orange pack still to use when you're smoking. Uh, in Quebec, these packs are the size of a pretty little lipstick container. Um, they're in pink and they're in green. They're, they're absolutely targeted to young people. They're also small ones the same size as an iPod. Uh, in silver and blue and, and, and targeting the young male market. Uh, these ones you've probably seen from China. This is my, my favourite but my worst uh, from East Timor. Uh, this is a pack, sorry for the quality, um, being sold with Marlboro with an MP3 player so you can play your music on it, uh, sold with the cigarettes and the industry says we are not targeting young people. Um, I think it's very clear to see that that is not true. Can I just stop there for a second and get an indication if I am speaking clearly enough, everybody? Yes, we're okay? All right. I'm very conscious of the slang we use in Australia and trying not to. So how did we manage to make this change in Australia? Nowhere else around the world had introduced plain packaging. Uh, we had a very strong industry arguing that we shouldn't do this. Luckily for me, as Health Minister, we had a fantastically strong group of researchers, of doctors, of public health officials, of cancer councils, heart foundations. They had lobbied us in opposition, not to introduce plain packaging, but to say, can you put more focus on preventative health? We send, spend so much money at hospitals at this end of the health system when people are already sick, can we do some more at the front end? So we set up, when we were elected in 2007, we set up an expert committee outside of the public service, specially to give us advice on the next steps we should take in tobacco control, in dealing with alcohol, and in dealing with obesity. And they gave us a long list of things, including plain packaging. And I think they will tell you now they didn't really expect the government to do it. 
We went down through that list uh, to look at how much everything cost, what was possible, which reforms could we do, which would have public support. And for us, plain packaging was actually the most obvious one to do. Um, it's actually it's a difficult political decision to make, but it's actually not a difficult reform to introduce. It only requires the manufacturers to change. Doesn't re it's not a focus on the individual smoker. It's not a focus on the individual retailers. Um, and in Australia, like in Sweden, the tobacco industry is not popular. As a politician, it's quite nice to have a fight with an industry that is not popular. <laughs> Normally, as the health minister in Australia, in the, in the Labor Party, the tradition is the people we fight with are the doctors, and that's, we never win. Um, you don't want to be on the other side of an argument to the doctors. On this argument, the doctors were on our side, the nurses were on our side, the public were on our side. Smokers were ringing up the radio station saying, I support this reform because I don't want my children to smoke. So part of the message is, in Australia, our success was built on the alliances of doctors, of non-government organisations and of researchers. They knew, and I knew, the government knew, we would be challenged. But I also knew I would not be alone when those challenges came. So I had a team of people, just like all of you in this room, who can make it possible for governments to act if you're very focused about what you ask for and if you are prepared to support them. You have to help them make the argument about why this, is, why this or another reform you might decide to prioritise <laughs> is the next thing that you want to do. I think this second part is all, third part is also very important. You must take these decisions and a government must know they will be challenged. You have to actually do this with your eyes open and know that the industry will try to do a lot of things to stop you because that means you plan differently for the way you implement your reforms. So I want to talk a little bit about that and I'm um, conscious of making sure I leave plenty of time for questions. So I'm giving you a quick overview and uh, we can come back to any of these in more detail if you want to. The industry is, uh, I've got too many different bits of technology working, hang on a second. Stupidly have my notes on one and yours on another. Um, the tactics that the industry used, when the government announced that we were going to make this change, there was a huge outcry from the industry. It's a disaster, it won't work, um, uh, illegal tobacco will go up, more, we'll have to drop our prices because we won't be able to compete with our coloured packs, so more people will smoke, um, e everything will go wrong and you can't possibly do this, and it will cost you a lot of money because we will sue you. Um, they did do all those things. So anybody making any type of tobacco control change has to be aware the industry is going to lobby and lobby hard. They gave our opposition millions of dollars in donations politically to try to convince them to vote against our changes. Funnily enough, when that became public, it actually forced the opposition to support us. They were determined to show that their vote could not be bought um, and they voted with us to prove that the industry could not buy them. Uh, that was a lucky outcome from a lot of money being given to them. They uh, did a lot of advertising. This is um, the nanny from the nanny state telling people what to do. Didn't look too much like me, but I was a bit worried. Uh, they spent, this was an advertising campaign that ran on television, it ran in the newspapers, it ran during our election campaign. And this just shows you a lot of different uh, campaigns. It won't work. Young people will start smoking at a higher rate. Never quite clear how that argument worked. Look how much money it's going to cost. Uh, all of these things were very heavily used. Um, in our election campaign, when we had already announced we were going to do this, but the legislation had not been passed, the tobacco industry hoped that they would be able to stop our government uh, from doing this or have our government lose at the next election. So the two major parties who spend the most money on campaign advertising, um, other than the two main parties, the tobacco industry spent the next highest amount during our election campaign on advertising. Um, 
and it didn't have any impact. There are a lot of other issues. This is one tiny issue uh, in the scheme of a whole national political debate, uh, but they still tried to do that. Um, they put out research that luckily our very sceptical media often uncovered. All small retailers are going to close because they won't be able to sell cigarettes in normal packets. Uh, turns out they interviewed three shop owners and then said this is what will happen across all of Australia. So they were very embarrassed when that got uncovered. Uh, they funded small, they, they set up a retail organisation and said it's not just the big manufacturers, it's not big tobacco, it's small shop owners, ma and pa shop owners, um, who will be affected. Turns out, actually, the campaign didn't have any retailers in it, all funded by the tobacco industry. So it's really important to know that these things can happen, because if you make a change here, and we've seen it in the UK, we've seen it in New Zealand, we've seen it in Ireland, they will try the same tactics. They'll be a little bit different, they'll have a Swedish flavour, but they will still be the same tactics. And you need to be very cynical about and prepared for what will happen. The media needs to be very cynical. And of course, your political leaders need to know that there's a way to tackle these arguments. Um, illegal tobacco counterfeit and it won't work. I'm going to come to those in a minute because we've got already now our first lot of data. We have very good news from Australia that these arguments from the industry are just wrong. They've just been proved to be wrong uh, and that will help any other country who might want to go down this path. Um, one argument that uh, I have found politicians to be very anxious about um, is a legal threat every type of legal threat will sue you under your constitution, will sue you under the European Union, will sue you under the World Trade Organization disputes. Uh, it'll cost your government a lot of money. Um, I was able to convince my colleagues in the cabinet that actually plain packaging was one of the cheapest things we could do in health. We didn't have to build a new hospital, we didn't have to pay for new drugs, we just had to pass legislation and put aside a little bit of money, <laughs> quite a little bit of money, to be able to defend the legal case. And uh, I'm not sure if it's the same in Sweden, but in Australia, normally you have to tell people how much money you're going to spend on different things if you're a government. We made a decision and we publicly announced that for the first time we would not tell anyone how much money we had set aside for that legal case. Because we knew if we did, that they would just keep spending until we got to the end of our money and still sue us in another forum. So we had to keep that secret. We told the public why we were keeping it secret um, and that was actually very well supported. Uh, from the industry's perspective, they would like the legal arguments to be about everything except health. And the battle always for you in supporting politicians that might make these decisions is to keep it coming back to the health risks from tobacco. If you're the tobacco industry, you would much rather have a nice argument about trademarks, intellectual property, look, we're just the same as any other company. If you make handbags, you wouldn't like your trademark taken away. If you're IKEA, you wouldn't like trade your trademark taken away. Um, it was good for us in Australia the other industries were very clear and said to the tobacco industry, do not connect us to you. Um, tobacco is different do not use us in your arguments. Um, and in some of the other discussions we're going to have in the conference, um, and I can show people that are interested, we have pictures of the ads that they ran with a, a Coca-Cola can. Imagine if you were you losing your trademark, how would you like it? You know, disaster. Uh, in fact, we were able to be very clear that it was not anything we were doing elsewhere. Uh, our High Court said, this is not the government taking your trademark. They don't want to use it. They're just restricting very heavily where and when you can use that trademark. You can still use it when you want to write a letter of complaint to the politicians. You can use your trademark. But you can't use it in the retail product that you are selling. And our High Court said that's fine. There are still some international disputes about that. Um, and my, I'm no longer in politics, but my uh, outside opinion is that the industry is trying to delay those cases for as long as possible and is telling countries like yours and others to just wait until the international disputes are finished with Australia and then consider it. 
and that'll be three or five or ten years down the track, by which time a lot of new smokers will already be addicted to their products and we've lost, we've lost time. Um, so I think preparing thoroughly as health people, remembering that you need good lawyers on your team early is very important. Um, the industry had paid almost all of our good lawyers in Australia before we started looking for our lawyers and then we realised they'd already briefed people and meant they couldn't act for the government. So getting in early with people so that there's people on your side is, uh, is very important. So there's some excellent news. Obviously the most important uh, part of it all is what does the data show us. Um, we were very careful in Australia. As Health Minister, I never made a promise about what impact I thought this would have. Would it go down by 2% or 5% or 10%? I always said this is a long-term reform. It's part of a whole package. We're changing taxes. We're um, providing money for nicotine patches. We're doing other things to help people quit smoking. Uh, and we won't see the results for a long time. What we now have is results from the first year of introduction, but those results are over a three-year period. So they include the two years that we had lots of debate, lots of discussion in the community about this reform, actually a lot of free advertising for the health message about how dangerous tobacco is, and then one year of implementation. And we saw the biggest drop that we've seen in two decades in smoking, a 2.5% drop. Now, this rate might seem high to you because you're also in a low-smoking low country. 12.8 is daily and occasional smokers. Um, it's lower if it's just daily smokers. This puts us the lowest in the world when you combine, but Sweden, Canada, Australia have always been very close. Um, and we will not be offended if other people get ahead of us because that will be good to keep pressure on to, to do things in the future. Um, another very good result in those statistics um, was that we saw the um, age at which young people try smoking increased. Um, so like in Sweden, it's not legal to smoke under 18, but we of course know people do. And what we saw is a jump in the age where, where people are trying, those people that try are trying their smoking. Good news that the, our High Court said uh, these laws were okay. My favourite part of the court case was when um, the lawyers for the tobacco industry tried to say uh, about their trademarks, look, this is very unfair, this is just stopping us telling people that our product is, um, you know, this sexy product and their product is an old-fashioned daggy one, it's nothing to do with the health um, risks. And one of the judges interrupted and said, but isn't that like saying if you were selling rat poison to something that kills animals, you know, um, that you wouldn't be able to put a health warning on that. That wouldn't make sense, would it? And the uh, in lawyer for the tobacco industry said, oh, no, well, of course, rat poison's a very different product. And the judge said, but it would kill people if they ate it, wouldn't it? And the lawyer said, yes. And if you smoke tobacco, it does kill people, doesn't it? And the lawyer said, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> and so at that point, we felt pretty comfortable we were going to win. Um, and the early research has been very positive, not just on consumption, but to show that all of the arguments so far have not been proved to be right. So the industry said people will switch to illicit tobacco. No evidence of any increase in illicit tobacco. Sort of doesn't make sense. Illicit tobacco in Australia or in Sweden is about avoiding tax. It's not about what colour the pack is, so it's not really logical that that would be a driver. Uh, no evidence of a burden on the retailers. People said it will be terribly hard. How will retailers know which pack is which? Uh, when I said in an interview, look, as far as I'm aware, most people can cope with alphabetical order. Um, they said, oh, anyway, it turns out that's actually very easy and a delay in the initiation for smoking. So that's the good news. That's the reason continuing to think about which reforms you can introduce is a good idea. There are some ongoing threats, uh, of course. The international trade arguments are ongoing and those legal threats are being used to delay uh, decisions around the world. New Zealand has said they will also introduce Australia's laws, but not until all the cases are finished. That's a good outcome for the industry. 
United Kingdom is having the same problem and I know that that's starting to be said in other countries. There's no real reason to wait. Um, nevertheless, they're using that as an argument. Research is being misused around the world. A couple of weeks before our national data came out, the industry gave a uh, bit of research, I use that in inverted commas, to a national newspaper. They put it on the front page of their newspaper saying plain packaging didn't work. Uh, within hours, it was uncovered that that research was industry funded, it was not credibly done, uh, it had actually no rigour to it. All the other newspapers and television shows heavily criticised this report. However, it appeared on the front page in the United Kingdom uh, right at the week that they were having a debate about plain packaging. So this is my point that I started with. They behave internationally and you need to make sure you understand as well what's happening internationally. Education is still vitally important. I know that there's teachers and others working in schools here. Uh, we see in countries like yours and ours the rate going down because there is a high level of awareness about the risks of smoking. That can change very quickly. I've been in uh, Africa recently where the health professionals responsible for managing tobacco programs were genuinely asking questions about whether the risks of smoking were really proved. Now, this is 60 years old, this debate, and that is not because those people are ignorant. It's because the industry is constantly out presenting to them their research and saying that it's not really as bad as everybody thought. We have to be aware of that because it, we can lose ground very quickly. And, of course, the same tactics will be used on new products. E-cigarettes in Australia is the next issue that we're tackling with. Um, you had some particular ones with SNUS, which I have no expertise in, so I uh, obviously won't, won't talk to you about today. So I think some of the lessons in a quick presentation that can be learned is you need good research. You have that in Sweden. You've had that for a long time. You need to be able to use it to your advantage with politicians. You need good lawyers. You may not like lawyers. You may think they're always too expensive. They certainly are in Australia, but it is an investment long term. And lawyers and scientists partnering up together are very powerful. You need good media. You need to spend time as advocates uh, teaching the media about the risks of tobacco, about the things that you think are basic, but that actually people need to relearn so that they're ready for this debate. As non-government organisations, I cannot stress enough how valuable it was to me, day in and day out, during a two-year campaign, to have a well-organised group of non-government players who spoke in favour of what we were doing. I never felt I would be in a national uh, television show on my own without another voice saying, this is a good idea. Uh, that is important because mostly politicians are not liked and trusted. A shame that that is, but that's mostly true. Doctors, nurses, teachers are, uh, and they should be uh, out there advocating for change. Stay connected internationally. Do all you can to develop a sceptical press. Keep educating the public. And don't be um, put off. The, the Cancer Council in Australia did not expect that we would introduce plain packaging. They'd asked for it before. They'd asked governments previously. You have to keep trying on particular things that you think will make a difference because the stars will align at some time. You'll get the right health spokesperson, you'll get the right motivation within the government, the industry will do something silly, you'll have some breakthrough, a famous person will die from a dreadful disease. Something can change very quickly and you need to be able to make the most of it. And you get to choose then which sort of pack, if you want to do this, you want to have. Uh, these are French, uh, these are ours in Australia. We uh, are pretty sure that this is one way of putting off uh, young people from smoking. We have a really uh, fun piece of uh, research that was done when the change first came in, when there were three months of both packs. And uh, what the research showed, a bit about human behaviour, was that people didn't leave these packs on the table in front of them. They put them back in their pocket or they put the menu over the top of it if uh, they were outside somewhere or they, they hid them. Uh, that's important because it makes smoking less normal and that helps in our campaign. 
So hopefully I've given you something to think about in a very quick run through of what we did in Australia. I'm happy to take questions and I'm going to be here uh, today and tomorrow and happy to talk to people individually as well if that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you.